There's a black and white picture of my mom at the age of 16, hanging on the wall of my living room. She's resting her chin in the palm of her hand. And she's actually wearing this ring, a blue star sapphire that my father gave her. My three daughters see that picture every day. My three-year-old has actually started pointing to it and saying, that's not my mommy, that's my grandma. Yes, that's mommy's mommy, we all say. Months ago, my seven-year-old sat next to me and said, a little out of nowhere, your mommy and dad are dead. You have no parents. That's true, I responded. I looked at her green-gray eyes, her lashes, her eyebrows, and she looked right back at me. Then she put her head on my chest, and I rested my chin on the top of her head. I savor these moments when my girls talk out loud about my mom and my dad, and they wrestle a bit with their absence. You know, they have to work things out in their head about what my parents might have been to them and how we as a family can weave them into our lives and how to navigate death's disruptiveness. I mean, this is really important stuff. <laughs> I know some people say it's too much for kids, it's too heavy, it's too dark, it's too complicated, but I adamantly disagree. My experience has taught me that grief needs to be heard. And this kind of openness can be life-saving. March 1st, 1981. I had just turned five about four days before. I was sleeping in my grandmother's bed, which I often did on the weekends. I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw a thin line of light at the base of the bathroom door. And I looked over and my grandmother wasn't in bed with me. Just seconds later, she emerged from the bathroom fully dressed she knelt down next to the bed, got really close to my face, and she said, I have to go. Your mommy's sick. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. My great aunt read me lots of books. The pokey little puppy is the one that I remember the most. <laughs> For minutes at a time that night, I pictured my mom you know, shivering in a sick bed, covered with a warm, thick blanket, a thermometer hanging off her lips like a cigarette. The next morning, early, the front door of my grandmother's apartment opened and the white light of the sun burst through it. The dark silhouettes of my father and grandmother floated through the doorway like apparitions. My mom was not with them. My dad sat on the sofa in front of me. My grandmother, his mother, seated next to him, and he said, your mommy's in heaven now. She's with the angels. Now in that moment, I understood the permanence of what I just heard. I mean, even at the age of five, when a lot of children don't register the finality of death, I understood at my core, in my center, that I would never ever see my mother again. My research on grief, and believe me, I've done a lot of research on grief since 1981, <laughs> has taught me that children often manifest their grief very physically. Uh, they literally embody their feelings. I walked in circles around the center of my grandmother's living room over and over and over, stomping my feet. Raising her hand to me and reaching out, my grandmother said, you can call me mommy now. In a split second, <laughs> I shot back, no. No, you're not my mommy. My dad sat with his eyes turned down. I mean, that moment for me is really remarkable as I think about it because it marks the point in time where my family and I chose two very different paths. I mean, I was barely five, right? I had just learned minutes before that my mother was dead. <laughs> Struggling with their own shock and disorientation, my family tried to fill the void that had been created by giving me someone else to call mommy, by restoring 
a mother in name to our family unit? And I said, no, no. My mother had existed. She couldn't just vanish one night and be replaced the next morning. I knew what I needed in the immediate aftermath of my mother's death. I made a choice to acknowledge my loss. Soon after I moved in with my grandmother, pictures of my mom disappeared. My dad went back to work, got his own place, eventually started dating again. Years later, it was my 13-year-old cousin who told me that my mom had actually died in a car accident. She hadn't died in the sick bed, I'd imagined, a thermometer hanging off her lips like a cigarette. That night, as I was in the back seat of my grandmother's car, I was glaring at her brown eyes in the rearview mirror. I mean, why had this been a secret? What else didn't I know about? Grief literature talks about the importance of telling the truth about death, especially to children. Approximately 4% of kids between the age of 5 and 16 have lost a parent or a sibling, and in the United States alone, that number is in the millions. Starting the morning after my mom died, and for years after, I wasn't able to confront the real reason she was gone. And when I finally realized what happened, you know, I was confused and angry about these barriers that had been imposed. And as I had before, I said no to them. No. No. Time and time again, when I was a teenager and a young adult, I made public declarations about my longing for connection around my mom's death. When I was 16, I was in a play, and I played a character named Claire, whose mother and father had been killed in a car accident, and I sang a solo called, What Is It Like to Be Dead? When I was in college, I wrote a 25-page personal essay called, My Silence Aching. That's what it was called. And I presented it to my father and my grandmother. I mean, I was out there with my grief. I wanted my classmates, family, friends, teachers to bear witness to my story. I was compelled, and I clearly still am, <laughs> to talk out loud about what had happened and how I felt. My father, in his silence, was on the opposite end of the spectrum. He left the theater before my curtain call when I was 16 and he and I never talked about what I wrote in my 25-page paper. He was alone, in his head, retreating from me. Now, grief is complicated, and I know it looks different for different people, but grief experts say that individuals who mourn in silence often isolate themselves and deny that anything is wrong, and sometimes suffer quietly from feelings of shame or guilt. My father mourned in silence. And I watched what repressed grief did to him. I mean, he became an alcoholic. Always nursing a beer when I was with them. You know, he was part of the New Orleans scene where alcohol really is a part of daily life for a lot of people. He functioned in that place for years, numbing himself a little every day. Eventually, he started taking pills. I mean, grief takes up a lot of space in the body and the mind, and for those who don't deal with it, loss can become intolerable rather than simply painful, and that can lead to self-destructive behaviors. You know, over time, my dad descended into more serious substance abuse, standing in methadone lines with a friend who actually overdosed and died after one of their trips to a clinic drinking orange juice and vodka every morning just to get out of bed. You know, he eventually lost his job and exhausted his 401k to pay his mortgage and lived briefly in his house with no electricity and a foreclosure notice plastered on the front door. In 2011, he came to my city, New York City, for rehab. But within five weeks, he checked himself out and was drinking again. I actually bought him a ticket for a Chinatown bus headed south out of New York City after we fought one night. You know, I said, 
You can't stay in my house and lie to me. He pleaded, please, please, just let me live my life. Only once did I push my dad on the silence. In a difficult email that I wrote to him, I alluded to the 30 plus years of silence between us and my failed efforts to get him to talk to me. He responded <laughs> in an email. I was in the car and held your mother when she died. Why don't you get it? This has been with me every day since. I can't ever forget it. I can't keep reliving this over and over, sweetheart. It's too painful. Imagine me pulling her through the window and watching her die. Three years ago, even before my third daughter was born, I was sitting with my girls at the kitchen table on a, on a summer night. And the kitchen window was open, letting in the thick, humid air that always reminds me of New Orleans. I was asking my girls about their fun-filled day that they'd spent with their aunt, my devoted sister-in-law. I think they'd gone to the trampoline park, and they'd had lunch at an Italian restaurant, and they had customized candy bags at Dylan's Candy Shop. Oh my gosh, they were giggling and giggling as they told me the details, and we were all smiling so widely. At one point, my four-year-old, four who um, was slow chewing her chicken, feeling perfect exhaustion, <laughs> contemplated the adventures that awaited her the next day with her aunt. And she threw her head back, and she sighed. <sighs> I wish Lily was our mommy. I froze. My wide smile went away. I, I mean, I didn't know what to do or say. And as the lump in my throat got bigger and bigger, I stood up from the table. I left my girls alone in the kitchen. I walked down the hallway and I locked myself in the bathroom. I sat on the toilet and the tears just exploded from my eyes. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. I mean, she didn't mean it. I know she didn't mean it. But the cries, I mean, they kept coming. Minutes later, I heard footsteps down the hallway. <laughs> and I opened the bathroom door just a crack and saw my oldest daughter standing there just a few feet away. She motioned her little sister a few steps behind her to follow her. I'm sorry, I said. <laughs> but you know, I lost my mom when I was a kid. And my biggest fear is that I'll die prematurely and that I'm replaceable. I mean, I was crying really hard. I couldn't say anything more and my daughters walked up to me and they put their arms around my neck and my oldest girl who was just seven said, Mommy, no one can replace you. <sighs> Minutes later, we were seated on the living room sofa and, you know, we talked a lot about my mom's death. I talked to them about how I longed my whole life for my mom and how I wished that my dad and I could talk about her. I wanted them to understand why such an innocent comment from a four-year-old, so innocent, could have triggered such an intense emotional reaction. And most importantly, I wanted them to understand that it is okay to be in pain. I thought a lot about what my grandmother had said so long ago. You can call me mommy now. My mother was not replaceable. With my girls in my arms, I knew that she was a part of their lives too. And that I wasn't replaceable either. In June 2013, my dad's neighbors called the police because something didn't smell right. The hazmat team went to his apartment and had to clean up after they removed his body. The medical examiner asked me to send her pictures of my father, and she used his tattoos to definitively identify him. I found out about my dad's death when I was at work, and by the time I got home that night and walked through the front door of my apartment, my girls ran to me. They climbed on my body. They put their hands on my body. I said, 
Papa died. What happened? I asked. He drank too much alcohol. He became really sick when his body stopped working. I once read that the great healer of our grief is validation, not time. All grief needs to be heard. My grief was not heard the way it needed to be by my father, and his was not heard by me. Within a few weeks uh, after my dad's death, I received an email from Alan Champagne, an old friend of my dad's uh, with whom I'd connected at the service. Alan called his email details. And this is what he wrote. I remember looking out my window toward my right and I saw a car ahead on a side road approaching a stop sign. As I was watching the car, I assume Margie was too, because all of a sudden the car did not stop for the stop sign, but accelerated onto the highway. Just as I saw it, Steve saw it, and Margie yelled, watch out. The next thing was our car started to roll over, side to side from the impact at least two times. Then we landed, right side up, in a swampy area, well off the highway. And then I heard Steve yelling Margie. Margie was partially ejected from the car. Her waist was on the door sill with her upper body out of the car and her lower body inside it. Steve pulled her into the car and held her tight, calling her name over and over. Her face was undamaged. She was still beautiful. I told Steve we had to get him out of the car. He would not listen to me. He just kept calling out to Margie. Why don't you get it? My dad had written to me in 2011, two years before he died, two years before I received this email from Alan Champagne. When I read this email, I was in my apartment in New York City with dinner simmering on the stovetop, my daughters nearby, a collage I had created of pictures of my mother, my father, and me before everything changed in 1981, propped up on a coffee table in the living room. With Alan's help, I got it. I got my dad suffering like I never had before because Alan enabled me to bear witness to his story. And I got that my dad's silent, repressed grief was as punishing as it was, probably because he thought he deserved punishment. You know, I wonder, if we had really talked to each other, if we had shared our grief, would he have survived? My dad's life ended too soon. But mine will go on, because I made a choice to confront my grief and tell the truth to myself, my family, and everyone who will listen, thank you for listening.